At first glance, he'd seem a deeply improbable person to call a political theorist. John Ruskin, one of the most ambitious and impassioned English social reformers of the 19th century, seemed to care mostly about one thing, beauty, which has a reputation for being eminently apolitical and removed from real life. And yet, the more Ruskin thought about beauty, the beauty of things humans make, the more he realised that the quest to make a beautiful world is inseparable from the need to remake it politically, economically and socially. In a world that's nowadays growing not only ever more polluted and unequal, but also, though we seldom remark upon it, uglier, Ruskin's emphasis on beauty and his understanding of its role in politics make him an unusual yet timely and very necessary figure. John Ruskin was born in London in 1819, the only child in a wealthy and cosseted home. Every year during his teens, he went with his parents on long tours of Europe. The place that most impressed him and changed the course of his life was Venice, which he first saw when he was 16, and to which he returned almost every year during long periods of his adult life. In Venice, he spent his days visiting churches, floating in gondolas, looking at paintings, and making highly accurate drawings of his favourite architectural details. On his return to England, Ruskin was struck by the contrast between the glories of Venice and the often dingy realities of British urban life. It's a familiar phenomenon. We too are liable to come back from the Grand Canal to Main Street and the corner store and feel our spirits sink. And yet, although we may mutter a few disparaging remarks, on the whole we leave it at that. We tend to feel that the ugliness that surrounds us is some sort of inviolable phenomenon which we would be best to resign ourselves to. But that wasn't Ruskin's way. He couldn't get over the appalling realisation that in one place human effort had led to such delightful results, and yet in most places the same or even more thought, money and labour had produced a landscape that was dismal and soul-destroying. Why was the contemporary world so dispiritingly, monstrously ugly? Ruskin began his career as an art critic, but by middle age a more direct and urgent goal came into view. He realised that the ugliness of most things in Britain was the clearest indication of the decadence, cruel economic ideology and rotten moral foundations of his society. He devoted the remainder of his career to an urgent, vocal fight against the underlying principles of modern capitalism. He was always off to harangue some group of industrialists in Birmingham or Sheffield about their crooked value systems and the immense, heart-rending superiority of Venice to modern England. But he was also interested in practical action. When his father died, he was left an enormous fortune. In 1871, he founded the Guild of St George. He had long admired the medieval guild system, where workers were well organised within trades that offered them both job security and pride in their work. So he set up workshops and a network of farms, creating sustainable, unadulterated foodstuffs. For a time, he was a leading maker of apple juice. He even wanted to set up a network of schools offering evening classes for workers as an alternative to the numbing mass media otherwise pushed their way. Some of his ideas succeeded. Ruskin's devotees started a business making jumpers, jams, even a museum. His most devoted disciple, William Morris, set up a highly influential interior decoration company. And the guild itself has survived today and still performs some of the work that Ruskin had championed. But of course, Ruskin didn't manage single-handedly to reform capitalism. It seems a general law that people who can think well aren't the most adept at organising change. They aren't good with the accounts, they get impatient with meetings, and so the world doesn't change as much as it should. However, Ruskin remains an inspiration to anyone who seeks not just to reflect on the world, but also to alter it towards beauty and wisdom. In the mid-1870s, while he was a professor at Oxford, Ruskin got increasingly bothered that his students went to parties and wrote essays, but never did anything very productive with their hands, which he believed had a detrimental effect on their characters. So he got together 60 students and organised them to mend a nearby road, which had become ugly and unusable, and to tidy the neighbouring green so the children could play on it. It took them a long time and they made very imperfect progress. There were complaints from the local landlord, and a general conviction that Ruskin was a touch unhinged but the underlying point is crucial. Out of fear of seeming ridiculous, we often end up not tackling the challenges around us. The road mending was a small instance of a larger idea that animated Ruskin's life, that it's the duty of creative, privileged people to direct their efforts towards making the world more pleasing and tidy, more convenient and beautiful, not just for themselves, but for the greatest good of the greatest number. Most of us have at some points felt that trees are lovely, that somewhere else is far more beautiful than where we live today, that there are too many shoddy things in the world, 
that work really isn't enjoyable enough, that often we are misemployed. But we tend to dismiss these thoughts as too personal, minor, not really of significance. Ruskin argues us into a more ambitious and more serious attitude. It is, he says, just such thoughts and experiences which need to be given proper weight, which need to be analysed and understood. They provide crucial clues as to what is really wrong with the world and can therefore lead us towards moves that may make it genuinely a little better.